Attorney Jeremy Rosenthal is joining me now. A couple of big cases I, I wanted to talk about. Jeremy, it's great to have you back on the Scott Sand Show. It's great to great to be here. And I'll tell you this much. The fact that there's US uh, UFOs sitting and watching us, that's the best news I've heard in like three weeks. <laughs> so, I mean, that's fine with me. Uh, they're, if they're watching us, they're laughing at us. I, I think it's... What, what's right? happening there? Uh, right? Speaking of watching yeah. stuff, have you uh, have you seen this documentary, The Menendez Brothers, on Netflix, or watched the? I think it's a ten part series, Monsters, on Netflix. It's it's part I, of this publicity around the Menendez mm-hmm. Brothers again. I, I have not, uh, as you know, Scott. I spend all my time reading learned treatises of the law and uh, studying and and. Uh, it, you know, thinking deep thoughts about legal things, as, right, you know, right. Netflix uh, and cooking shows, not so much. <laughs> I do. I do love cooking shows as well. Uh, for some reason over the last year, and I think it's in part due to to millennials and social media. And if it's not, that's who's going to get the blame. There's been a, a movement afoot to to free the Menendez brothers who killed both of their parents in 1989, I believe, and were convicted a few years later and have been in jail ever since. Uh, apparently, new evidence may be available, and and the relatives of the Menendez brothers are coming together. In fact, as we speak, I just got an alert on Twitter that there's a press conference happening right now in Los Angeles. I don't know what they're talking about there, but but Lyle and Eric Menendez, serving life without the possibility of parole, may get a, a second bite at the apple. Uh, what what have you seen from this case development so far? A lot of interesting things. Uh, if you go back uh, to 1989 and, and and when the trial was in the early 90s, the theory was, uh, for defense anyway was that these boys were molested by their by their father, that the home was very unstable, very violent, uh, not not a very good place. Now, does that translate directly into self-defense? Well, it, it, it can. It can in certain instances. Um, and and we don't know because they had multiple trials. One trial, they allowed that defense the other trial that they ultimately were convicted on did not really allow that defense. And all the evidence that's come to light really just sort of highlights that, uh, that the, that the father was a, was a sexual predator, um, that, that he did, uh, uh, that he molested uh, at least one of his sons. There's another, uh, uh, singer from Menudo uh, of all places, the, the, the boy band back then, uh, that also claims to be a victim, and so it makes that a lot more likely. And so if, if you're looking at two different things, yes, maybe there's a new trial on guilt innocence, but they've already been in prison for 30 years. And had a jury or a judge known that that was the mitigating circumstance, they don't get, uh, maybe they don't get uh, a life sentence. Maybe they're already out and maybe they're free. Yeah, it's It's interesting because in the first trial, it resulted in a hung jury. I think uh, from what we've learned, some of the female members of the jury were able to sympathize with the Menendez brothers' claims. At that, in that trial, they were able to present evidence that they, that they were molested by their father, Jose Mendez. Menendez. Uh, and the reason uh, why these new allegations have come out uh, from this member of the boy band Menudo is Jose Menendez was in the entertainment industry and with a record company that, that launched the career of Menudo. Um, and and now we're we're learning that I this is really corroborating corroborating testimony, I guess, because before, uh, especially if you watch the Monsters series, uh, it, it was hard to believe whether or not they were making up those stories or not as a way to to try to get mm-hmm. out of the murders. It, it doesn't help when they go on a big spending spree after right, the right, fact. Right. 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 Uh, and so and so there that that was a big part of the prosecution's case back in the day was that, OK, these kids go wild after this and and they're 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 going crazy. They're not acting like somebody would act. However, that would be that that murdered their parents out of desperation uh, because of an abusive uh, childhood. So uh, that that part is difficult to 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 square. Ultimately, I mean, if you're the Menendez brothers, if you're their lawyer, Mark Garagos, what you're saying is, look, OK, and now I don't know how I don't know how how far they want to take it. Do they want a new trial where uh, where they can be exonerated? Maybe that's a big deal to them. You might sit in prison for 30 years and say, what's another year and a half for me to wait for a new trial? 
right? And if I can get exonerated this and, and have my name cleared, what are they going to do? Sentence me to life? Well, we're a little late for that. That's already happened. So it can't get any worse. Or uh, what I think is probably even more likely is just they get a new punishment sentence or punishment hearing. Uh, and the judge says, OK, I'm going to sentence you to 20 years time served. Uh, go get your things. You're free because they will have obviously served well, well, well enough time. And they they admitted that they killed their parents. So I I mean, the the minimal charge would be I, I assume. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Some sort of manslaughter charge. Potentially, uh, I mean, you have um, in in a murder case, you're always looking at the intent element. It is the intent. Uh, which is going to dictate how severe uh, the charge is going to be, right? Did we plan this for seven months, right? Uh, are we are we doing this despite children? Are we doing this for inheritance? Are we doing it for this or that? And then there's then there's I made a a bad turn on the highway and uh, and, and and people died because of that, right? And maybe that's criminal and and maybe it's not, depending maybe if you're on your phone, it could be. But uh, where in 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 this case would that lie? Well, you could say that that because of their state, because they were abused, because they were children uh, that that had been sexually traumatized by this man, um, does that does that negate their mental state? Uh, it, it's an argument. I, I don't know that it necessarily wins. Is it enough of an argument to turn this into manslaughter or something lesser? Potentially, but it, when you have a lot of sympathy, sympathy and, and this type of public outpouring, uh, regardless of where it's from, this is wind at, at, at the Menendez brothers back. And it's really it puts a lot of pressure on the politicians. It puts pressure on the district attorney and the judges. Uh, so it, it's really it, it's really a hard movement if you will, to repel if you're if you're the authorities, especially in Los Angeles, I, I would expect that D.A. George Gascon is going to go with the resentencing route and, and try to base it maybe on some factors like rehabilitation. We're talking to Jeremy Rosenthal, Texas Defense Firm dot com. I, I think one of the interesting things about the Menendez brothers case, if I'm not mistaken, it was the first time that battered women's syndrome, battered wives syndrome was used as a defense with male defendants. Uh, I don't that, that wouldn't surprise me um, that that certainly about the time in the in the era that that we started seeing uh, the battered woman defense. Um, and yes, it's very rare to see that uh, for men. But I, I, I think that everybody would agree that it's certainly valid. Right. Um, and, and that it and that it can be very very you know poignant i mean uh you, you know you can't uh it if if the menendez father is is as bad as they say he is uh then you really your heart really goes out to those to those boys uh you know to those to those sons and and what that must have been like to to grow up in a house like that um and and that kind of trauma um you could see how it could push folks to and and potentially over the edge uh so so I mean, it's a it's a it's a pretty heart wrenching story. Yeah, and, and I gotta wonder, even if you're going to use the claim of rehabilitation and resentencing them, what kind of people they have become after thirty plus years in jail, where where you got to question whether or not there's actually any rehabilitation that's taking place. And I I, I don't want to I don't want to judge because I don't know them, I, and I, right. I certainly don't know them now. But uh, it is a, a question of what do they do if they are released. And what happens to the inheritance money that they weren't weren't able to get because they were convicted of murder? That's a whole other question that we could probably talk about. Jeremy Rosenthal, TexasDefenseFirm.com. Uh, the other case that I'm keeping a close eye on, because this yeah. is just a, a heartbreaking story, and uh, I've talked about this a lot, and uh, we've got a great podcast on iHeartRadio called Down the Hill. It's the, the Delphi murders. Two young girls were out walking around in the woods by their house when they, they were killed by by a stranger, and uh, and and the the stranger was apparently captured on video uh, on uh, on one of the girls' uh, cell phones, uh, just telling them to go down the hill, and they were found shot uh, the next day. And after five years, a suspect was finally apprehended, and and now as this trial begins, jury selection took place in less than a day, which is unusual in a case like this. Uh, there are questions about whether or not they've got the right guy. I, I mean, I, identity is always 
uh, you know, the issue in a in a case like that. Um, sometimes jury selection, uh, you, you know, you, you hope that they're not rushing the system. And uh, sometimes um, sometimes lunch is a big, a big motivator in getting cases done quickly. <laughs> you would you would hope that that's not the situation there. Uh, you would hope that it's the folks aren't being too cavalier about it. Uh, what tends to really make jury selection a, a longer process is um, the public, the, the 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 publicity of it, and sometimes some judges will want to individually uh, question the jurors. Uh, so in those instances, um, it's it's um, uh, that that can be very very time consuming. In in the Donald Trump jury trial this uh, this last summer. Uh, that judge actually did a faster than normal job, I thought, because he just he just brought in groups of 100 people or something like that and just said, all right, raise your hand if this isn't for you. And and they wouldn't. And and normally what you would do is you would want the folks who raise their hands. Normally, the lawyers are going to drill down on those guys. Right. The lawyers are going to. Well, let's talk about this. Let's ask this. And you get. It's a free pass, um, but you never. That case goes really quickly for through jury selection, uh, and we'll see if that's indicative of the rest of the case. But it sounds like, you, you know, the other thing, too, is when you have a really, really finite issue, when it's the identity and the identity alone, uh, OK, we can spend a day on the knife. We can spend a day on here's the serrated wound. We can spend a lot of time on those other things. The defense isn't really necessarily uh, arguing with that. Right. It, it, it's the finite identity issue. Richard Allen is the suspect, Jeremy. Uh, he was 44 at the time of the murders, and he was linked to this case and, and apparently on the police radar the entire time from a forty caliber unspent round that was found close to the bodies. But two sketches that were released from the cell phone video look nothing like this guy. Is, is this possibly the case where, where the guy was out shooting his gun in the woods and, and had an unspent round, and, and now he's... He's being charged with these two murders, and it was actually somebody else. I mean, that seems like that seems like a hard path to take for the defense, but there's not a, a lot of other evidence there, at least that we've learned about yet. It, that's the fear in in any kind of a case. Uh, look, we all, you know, more than anything, we want to get it right, uh, and 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 so the more direct evidence that you have, the more comfortable you feel. Um, so, and, and it, it's hard to sort of uh, unpack this, but it, when you look at the Innocence Project, when you look at, um, for instance, all the folks that walk out of death row after one, two, three, five decades, the Innocence Project has done a really remarkable job uh, revolutionizing not only public, I mean, not only swaying public opinion, but also kind of narrowing down on, on a lot of the factors that contribute to getting it wrong. And, and think about it like this. There are so many cases out there where we are all convinced that this guy did it, whether it be a sexual assault, whether it be a homicide, you've got eyewitness testimony, you have all the ingredients, right? The, the, the alibi doesn't make sense. Um, all of these things. And then we fast forward 30 years and one speck of DNA, just one little speck of DNA tells us that we were completely wrong, completely wrong about the entire thing. Um, and and what, what's hard as a lawyer is to tell jurors, look, um, that case was always, pardon my language, that case was always crap. It was it was crap the minute the jury saw it. You, everybody just let themselves believe that it was real. Everybody got drawn off sides by the emotional part of this case. Um, there is some circumstantial evidence that doesn't look so hot. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the type of case that you're going to read about in 20 years, and we're going to and 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 you will see that just just a just a smidge of evidence shows that you are all wrong. So the circumstantial cases from that st standpoint can certainly be very scary. You mentioned the Innocence Project. My longtime friend Jason Flom with, with the Innocence Project is doing an amazing job there. Jeremy Rosenthal here on the Scott Sancho, TexasDefenseFirm.com. We're running really late, but I wanted to ask you one more question about the Delphi murders case. The jury mm -hmm. is not going to hear one of uh, the defense attorney theories that the two girls were ritually sacrificed by neo-Nazis who were followers of mm -hmm. a, a pagan Norse religion 
known as Odinism, uh, which seems like it would be inflammatory, controversial to bring this up, but shouldn't the defense be allowed to present their theories at trial? Uh, yes, I mean, there, there's rules when when you're when you're sort of presenting your defense, um, and 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 it can be it can be very tricky. Um, I'm not what I'm not allowed to do, for instance, uh, as a defense lawyer, I'm not allowed to put somebody else on trial for it um, necessarily, unless I can find some kind of a nexus uh, between that. And look, I mean, you have to make it make sense and you have a constitutional right to present a defense and a complete defense. Um, uh, and, and that's part of your right to effective assistance of counsel. That's part of your Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. That's part of your due process rights under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. It's got to pass the smell test. And 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 you just, I mean, to put it bluntly, PG-13 program here, you can't piss off the judge, right? right, right. If you, the farther and farther and farther you go out of bounds, the more likely you are to be essentially shut down. Um, if I'm a trial judge, I let you do whatever you want as the defense. Um, and, and, and for the reason that in, in, in most instances, you you are, you are just cutting off an appeal, right? Uh, because look, you lost, you lost fair and square. I gave you everything that you asked for this, this conviction is going to stand, uh, an effective trial judge is going to. It, it, ties are going to go that way. A tie is going to go to the runner. I shouldn't say you're going to get everything that you want, but uh, I, I mean, if if I'm the judge, I tell the prosecution, convince me why we shouldn't do it this way, right? Um, because I, I'm not going to be accused of not of, of violating this man's constitutional rights, and we're not doing this whole trial again just because I think he's guilty. And just because I'm going to I'm, I'm going to disallow this evidence that I think is a waste of time, uh, it, it gets judges in really hot water when when they do those sorts of things. That's a great explanation. Jeremy Rosenthal, Texas Defense Firm dot com here on the Scott Sancho. Always appreciate uh, your insight on uh, into cases like this. Two fascinating trials uh, that we're looking at closely, and I'm sure we'll have more information over the coming weeks. And next time you're on, maybe we'll get the video to work. Man, you know what? It, it, it is great. Uh, you know, I. I, I know you you joke that you have a face made for radio. I am extremely handsome, and <laughs> uh, and and if you think I'm a good lawyer, oh my god! I mean, I am. So it is. It's a real shame that we weren't able to do it this way. <laughs> Damn good looking man, smart guy. Thank you, Jeremy. We'll yes. talk soon. Yes, yes, we'll yes. talk soon. All right.